keep thinking that I'm going to do a Sunday homily on the ass backwardsness of everything. And I have a <clears throat> lot of different ways of talking about that, but uh, I don't really feel like I have the voice for it yet. I've been uh, dealing with the ravages of winter in Phoenix, the easiest winter there is, dealing with the ravages of winter in Phoenix since before Christmas. And, uh, I am substantially well, but <clears throat> still, um, I'm still full of phlegm. I am phlegmatic always, but uh, when I am full of phlegm, I am not uh, quite as sanguine as normal. But at New Year's, I um, published my learn something significant post. I forget how I phrase it in that post. I wrote that several years ago, but I like to repeat it every New Year's. Master something difficult this year. And then uh, on January 5th, I um, wrote in response to David Brody a um, short essay on what I consider to be the way to go about teaching self-adoration to children. And that had me thinking about DIS because one of the recommendations I made is, number one, to be aware of the DIS profile of your students, but um, also um, to encourage them to gain strength on the weak quadrants of the DISC profile, of their particular DISC profile, but also to require them to be good in every quadrant of the DISC profile, that you require the work that they're going to do should be, these are the words that I use, should be well-planned, well-executed, well-presented, and well-meant. And we have it there, C-D-I-S. And every good thing, everything that is well-made, every job that is well-done is done that way. It's well-planned, well-executed, well-presented, and well-meant. And of those, of course, the hardest is well-meant. But that would be my challenge to you in this new year, is to do everything that you do in that way. You want to encourage that in your children, and if you are a teacher, you want to encourage that in your students. But again, the Ustus S. Magister Optimus practice is the best teacher, and... Um, a job well done is the best example. So if you want to lead other people, poetry is leadership, if you want to lead other people into doing their well work as well as they can do it, um, do your work as well as you can do it. Uh, be careful to plan the work out, do the job and then some, make it impressive in the way that it presents itself. Be sure that it's actually good for you and for the people that you love. It's well meant. And this all ties in with the ass backwardsness of everything because um, it takes us back to DISC in a way that um, makes it understand that everything of DISC is fear-based. I'm inclined to say that sociables are the most normal, closest thing to normal mammals that you will find among human beings, but um, there are no normal mammals among human beings. There cannot be any normal mammals among human beings because we are not normal mammals. The persistence of memory all hail the persistence of memory. The persistence of memory is what makes conceptualization possible. It's what makes us conceptually conscious. It's what makes us so radically different from all other, not just all other organisms, from every other entity that we know of in the universe. We are unique. We are sui generis. We are the thing without a, the sole member of our category. 
there's nothing we know of like us and everything that uh, scientists and uh, science popularizers like to say to equate non-human intelligence with human intelligence is all just a joke. It's all just a terrible joke. This is the dancing bear fallacy and um, I don't cite it anywhere near as often as I could. I could cite it every day if I wanted to because there's always a dancing bear story somewhere. But it really doesn't matter because we know there is nothing else like us. We all know this. This is completely obvious and we like to indulge those stupid things for the reasons that I named yesterday in a, a post about um, the information value of emotion. I know there are no dancing bears and yet I want there to be dancing bears. And this creates emotional disquiet and that disquiet will um, have enduring and accelerating negative consequences on your life if you're not careful in your business. But um, it's interesting to me to think that every disc profile is in a sense a um, manifestation of fear. And the fear exists because of the persistence of memory that we can conceptualize. But one of the things that we're great at conceptualizing is um, past disasters. How to avoid future disasters by being aware of past disasters. This is the whole notion of um, a virtue consisting of non-vice comes from this. But um, the idea of best practice, practices that you hear all the time is exactly the same thing, that best practices are the practices based on a knowledge of past disasters. There's a uh, website called lesswrong.com, and there could not be any better expression of the cautious frame of mind than to think that knowledge consists of the reduction in the number of errors. Virtue consists of the absence of sin. These things are not true. And we will deal with them another day. I don't have the voice to deal with it, and I don't know that I really have um, everything worked out in my own mind. But it, this all comes back to the idea of um, the garden versus the dump that I've been talking about since the very beginning of the Church of Splendor. That um, We live in a civilization that is dominated by cautious temperaments and all the cautious can do is um, look at the dump and attempt to understand the universe by cataloging its garbage. All they can do is fear and they're so busy fearing that they never have time to hope. Whereas if you turn around and face that paradise just over the hill from the dump then all you can see is hope and you have no time for fear. And it's that difference in attitude that accounts for the difference in everything else. I'm inclined to uh, chastise the libertarians writ large for focusing on all the wrong things. The thing that matters most to human liberty is um, thoroughgoing fatherhood, self-consistent, self-responsible fatherhood. Uh, liberty is made possible by fathers, by fathers defending their own freeholds, their own families, their own estates, their own arsenals. And in the absence of that kind of fatherhood, there will be no liberty, there can be no liberty. And so accordingly, for libertarians, first to um, ignore the family, which is bad enough, but second to attack the family um, by means of um, sexual promiscuity, abortion, um, divorce laws, or even just the notion of divorce. Everything that attacks the family attacks human liberty necessarily because without thoroughgoing fatherhood there can be no liberty. But in reality, without that firm conviction that tomorrow can be better than today, that hard work pays off, without that hope for the future, in a intellectual culture that is thoroughly dominated by fear, there cannot be any thoroughgoing fatherhood. There cannot be any happy children. There cannot be any future in the long run. If all you are doing is cataloging all the ways that you found so far to avoid disaster, you're just looking to get punched in the nose by the next disaster that you haven't foreseen. Prosperity comes from accumulating wealth accumulating new means of producing wealth, not from plugging the gaps in your balance sheet, not from minimizing your losses.
And that's why I think being more thoroughgoing about being 100% D, 100% I, 100% S, 100% C in every work of the mind that you produce, going out of your way to gain strength where you are weakest in your disc profile and making a virtue of that necessity by imbuing your work in every way with the ultimate best you can do at every way of expressing the disc motivations, that this will tend over the long run to turn you away from that dump and turn you toward that garden of paradise. Your fears are irrational. They bear no relation to reality. You live a life of peace and splendor. Almost nothing bad ever happens to you, and yet you spend all your time trying to figure out how to be less wrong instead of trying to figure out how to be more right. And I guess my big epiphany this week was realizing I've known it all along. I'm standing back to back. The driven and the cautious stand back to back. And why can't they see eye to eye? They're not looking at each other. Why can't they see each other's worlds? Because the driven can, or the driven can see nothing but the garden and the cautious can see nothing but the dog. That cautious temperament is in error. It is based in irrational fears, fears that are not proportionate to the facts of reality. You could argue that the uh, driven optimism is um, Pollyannish, looking at the world through rose-tinted glasses. But the fact of the matter is, it's the attitude that you wake up with that shapes your whole day. And if you wake up miserable, your life will be miserable. If you wake up fearful, your life will be fearful. Anxious. Disquieted. Annoyed. Despairing. Depressed. Morose. Sorrowful. If your life is based on loss avoidance, your life will consist of nothing but losses. Whereas if your life is based on virtue pursuit, your life will consist of nothing but virtue. And that's why it matters. That's why the church of splendor matters. That's why splendor as such matters. And that's why the seven billion not-so-busy breeders of the earth need to be studying me. Because as far as I can tell, I'm the only person who encouraging you to stop being afraid and start being delighted instead. My name is Greg Swan. This is the Church of Splendor. I will be stronger in voice sooner or later. The weather will warm up in Phoenix and I will feel like bellowing. But in the meantime, I'm so glad you could join me this week and I will talk to you again next time.